day. You can bring God's word. And next week, uh, Pastor Tara, that'll free me up to just kind of help see us over the finish line uh, of that building and get ready for the dedication. Uh, but this is the confidence I have. Every one of our staff preach the word of God. They bring the word to us. So I'm excited to hear what God has to say to strange name for a prayer meeting until you hear the story of Lydia. This month we've been learning about some of the more obscure or less lesser known people in the book of Acts and today our focus is on Lydia. You know in Acts 16 Paul attends a riverside prayer meeting outside of Philippi where there's a group of praying women and one of them is this businesswoman named Lydia. And her response to the good news impacted not only her family and the city of Philippi, and in fact later the Philippian church began meeting in her home, but ultimately it impacted Europe and the entire world. So God used this woman and her prayer meeting to change history. So I think she's worth looking at. But before we get to her, let's begin with how Paul ended up in Philippi in the first place. We'll start in Acts 16. First three verses. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. So Paul wanted to go to Asia, and in this passage it's actually referring to modern day Turkey. And yet God forbade him two times, told him he was not supposed to go in that direction. And I think it's interesting that the Holy Spirit actually forbade Paul from doing something that we would think of as being good. He wanted to go and preach the gospel. So we see here that Paul ended up in Troas, and it was at least his third choice. But it was the Holy Spirit's first choice. And Paul, who was completely responsive to the Holy Spirit, was willing to lay down his will and his plan for the Spirit's direction. But don't you think Paul might have been puzzled when God kept shutting the door? But he knew that God's no is just as important as God's go. And closed doors are one of the ways that God leads his people. I really enjoyed thinking about Psalm 37 this week. It reassures us the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. And Paul shows us why we must pay such careful attention to hold how the Holy Spirit is directing us. Because we might know of something good that we could do. And yet, if we listen, we may sense the Holy Spirit is taking us a different way. You know, sometimes we are like Paul. We are so eager to reach people for Christ or to do something for the kingdom of God. Maybe it's a hope or a dream that we just, we have for our own lives and it seems so good to us. But then God says, no, not that. And no, not that. <clears throat> But we shouldn't get discouraged or lose heart because as we see, see here, Paul was being guided by hindrances in order to get to just the right place. And you know, the Holy Spirit can lead us as much by the closing of doors as he does by the opening of doors. 
If we think of some of the great heroes of the Christian faith, like David Livingston, he wanted to go to China, but instead God sent him to Africa. Or William Carey, he's the father of modern missions, and he originally wanted to go to West Africa or to Tahiti, but then God directed him to India. Or Adoniram Judson, he first went to India, but then God directed him to have a ministry in Burma. You know, throughout our lives, God guides us along the way, and he will always take us to just the right place. Now, we also know that the enemy can try to thwart God's plan, and he can try to shut doors to bring us harm or to harm the kingdom of God. But if that happens, as we stay trusting God, he can use what the enemy meant for evil to bring about good, so we still shouldn't get discouraged. The only safe place for us to live is to rely completely on God. He will show us which way to go, like it says in Isaiah 30. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, is this the way you should go? Whether to the right or to the left. So we can trust the Holy Spirit to guide us, and closed doors shouldn't bring discouragement, because he is able to open the doors that need to be opened. And he's preparing the people that he wants us to reach in advance, and he's preparing circumstances in advance. And so we can never go anywhere by the Holy Spirit's prompting where he hasn't already gone first. So now let's go on in verse uh, 9. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave from Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace. And the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. <laughs> So the man from Macedonia was asking for help. And he didn't specify what kind of help they needed. He didn't say, say what kind of help he was asking for. But Paul knew what the ultimate help was. And that's being able to receive the gospel. And as we're interacting with people who have not yet been saved, we need to keep in mind that the, ulti of the ultimate help that every person needs, and that's hearing the message of Jesus. Other types of help are good, and we should look for lots of ways to help others, but it should always pave the way for the most important help, and that is a life transformed by Christ. And you know, I believe there are many people today who, if we could hear the cry of their hearts, they would be saying, help us. They are so hungry for the gospel and have no one who will share with them the good news. You know, recently, I heard the testimony of a man who um, had been a Muslim, and he converted to Christianity. And he said he had been here in the United States um, as a Muslim for many years, and yet no one had shared with him about Jesus. Now, eventually, someone was brave enough and told him about Jesus, and he got saved. But he did not understand why he had been here so many years, and he had known Christians throughout the t that time. And he it thought... They didn't care enough about me to share the gospel. May we have the sensitivity and the obedience and the urgency that Paul had to listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting to speak of Christ to others. And if we're willing to do that, God will provide the opportunities. And then notice in this passage that they didn't receive their destination until they were already moving. So after God kept shutting the doors to Asia, they headed through the open door to Troas. And then when they got to Troas, that's when God made the direction clear for Paul. You know, I think sometimes we don't want to set out in doing something for God until we have the full plan, right? We want the roadmap laid out in front of us. And yet it was as they were going, God unveiled the plan. And this reminds me of the Israelites. Do you remember then? They were going to cross the Jordan River into the promised land and take Jericho. And yet God told they had to cross the Jordan River when it was at flood stage. And God told them, go set your foot in those raging waters. 
And it wasn't until they put their foot in that the water's parts that had been walked through on dry ground. And if they hadn't taken that first step of obedience, they never would have seen the miracle. Sometimes God will not show us the next step until we've acted in faith and obedience, taking that first step, however small it seems. And that step may set up the miracle. And so Paul sets for us the proper example that we should instantly carry out the will of God when we are assured of it. We don't need to question if it, if it makes sense. We just go. We just obey. And so when God spoke to Paul, there wasn't any questioning. He would already decided he was going to follow Christ. So when God spoke that decision, whether or not to obey, <coughs> obey had already been made. And so here we come to Lydia. It says in scripture, on the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized, and she asked us to come be her guests. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. So Paul and his companions were filling the time gap between their arrival in Philippi and the Sabbath. Now, according to the New American Standard Bible, it says they were spending some days in this city. Now, according to one commentator, this verb that's translated spending or staying has connotations of wasting time. Here they had hurried to do what God had asked, and yet they may have felt like they were just wasting time those first few days. Why did God send them there? And so then the Sabbath rolls around, and we know that Paul's custom was he would go into the synagogue to preach the gospel. And yet... When he got there, there wasn't even a synagogue where he could go to preach. So this implies that there were fewer than 10 Jewish men in that city because that's how many men were required for them to have a synagogue. And so Paul and his companions headed out to the riverside where they found what was likely just a small band of women praying. Now, wherever the Jews were not able to have a synagogue, they would have a place of prayer, and these were usually found by a river because part of Jewish law stipulated that they had to have ceremonial cleansing from defilement in a little font called a mikvah and, and, and so in a mikvah you would go in and you would soak in the water and dry off and say your prayers and the law of the mikvah was that it had to have water flowing into it and then it had to have water flowing out of it in other words it had to be living water it, it couldn't be stagnant and so that's why they would meet at a riverside if there wasn't a synagogue. So it would make sense that Peter, that Paul would head there looking for Jewish people. But do you think Paul was disappointed? Here he saw a man in a vision begging for help. So he hurried to get there. But now there was no man. There wasn't even a synagogue where he could preach. It was just this little group of women. And yet God was leading Paul every step way. He's the one who closes doors, and he's the one who opens them when he wants us to reach someone for Christ. And, and so here we see that Paul sat down to speak with the women. Now, usually when Paul preached, he would stand up. So the fact that he sat down implies that he was just having a more informal conversation with them. And you know, sometimes our greatest times of witnessing it comes in conversation with the people that we just encounter throughout our day. The people that we just meet up with. And I think that's why God tells us we are always to be ready to share the reason for our hope. And so here, Paul met Lydia. She was a Gentile woman who worshipped God. And it says that she was a seller of purple goods. Now, the purple dye came from a specific shellfish. And the waters from around Thyatira, which is where she was from, produced the brightest hues and the most permanent hues. And this dye had to be extracted drop by drop. So it was very difficult to make and it was very expensive. 
And so since she was a merchant of this cloth, it seems that she was capable and she was well-to-do and she was also a seeker of God. And so we can see that Lydia and her companions, they were God-fearing women, and yet they didn't yet know the gospel. And they were meeting there to pray. They were just doing the best that they knew how to serve and worship God. And so God saw their desire, and he sent Paul to share with about Jesus. You know, some people think that they're going to get into heaven because they're a, a good enough person. Maybe we've even known someone that we have a witness to because they seem like a person with, they're led by such good morals and they have such high standards and maybe they're even religious in some way, like Lydia. And yet, that isn't enough like we see here because Lydia was a God-fearing woman who apparently went regularly to pray. And yet, until she believed in Jesus as her Savior, it wasn't sufficient. Throughout scripture, we see there are a number of people who were very religious and yet still in need of a savior. On Pentecost, there were many devout Jews in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit had Peter go and preach to them. Or, or like the Ethiopian eunuch we studied a couple of weeks ago. Or, or Cornelius, a, a devout Gentile. Who were, these were all people who worshiped God. But without Jesus, even religious people who show up to church every Sunday are lost. They all needed a savior. So let us be quick to share the gospel with everyone and make sure we aren't dependent on our own good deeds to think we're going to get to heaven. So when Lydia heard Paul's message, she immediately received it with joy and her, and her household as well. And she became the first person to become a Christian on the continent of Europe. This little prayer meeting was used to birth the church in Europe. What might our prayer groups birth? You know, as we see the great revivals, the great moves of God in past, we see that there's a common denominator. It's people who have begun to cry out for God. And God responds to desperate hearts that come before him in prayer. That's why we've made prayer one of our key values here at Faith Journey, and we have prayer groups many days of the week. Maybe God will use our prayer groups, our little prayer groups, along with those of many other praying Christians to birth a movement that will turn our continent back to Jesus. I am confident that can happen. So when God asks us to pray, we shouldn't judge our prayer groups by how small or how humble they seem. Because even a small prayer group can change history. We can... <laughs> I think that needed emphasis. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the whole prayer. You don't have to break in anyway. We can also take great comfort in knowing that God knows the perfect way to reach the people that we are praying for. You know, Lydia hadn't heard the gospel. And so God rerouted Paul and his friends and ensured that Lydia would be in the right place at the right time to encounter Paul and to hear the good news of Jesus. Do you have someone that you are praying for? Don't give up. Because God knows how to orchestrate events and timelines in order to ensure that your loved one hears the gospel when they are ready to receive it. You know, God kept shutting the door for Paul to send him to Lydia so that she could be saved. And God will go to great lengths to reach individuals. So we must never despair that anybody is beyond God's ability to reach them. You know, Lydia and her praying companions had apparently been seeking God regularly. We can assume that this was her habit. And then one day, Paul showed up and told them the good news, resulting in, in her salvation and the salvation of her entire household. And that must have seemed to happen so suddenly that everything changed in a day. What a miracle. And yet all those weeks and months 
months or even, and even years of praying and seeking God and hungering for him set the stage for that sudden event to happen. You know, when we experience sudden breakthroughs of God, there have often been periods of faith-filled prayers that caused them when we said, I will not give up. So if you've been praying for something for a long time, don't get discouraged. Because those prayers may be laying the groundwork for another one of God's suddenlies where everything changes in a day. Be encouraged that your breakthrough may come at any moment if we persevere and don't give up. Like Paul wrote in Galatians 6, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So let's go back now to why God kept shutting that door. Paul wanted to go and spread the gospel in these different cities, and he wasn't doing it out of selfish ambition. He wanted it all for God's glory, and yet God said no. Instead, God redirected him to Lydia, and there were other people who were saved on this trip as well, but she was the first person to be converted in Europe. So maybe we could think of it this way. In Paul's mind, he set out wanting to reach a few cities in his region for Christ. God wanted to give Paul a continent to win for Jesus. Sometimes we want to do something good for God. We want to do something to make an impact for the kingdom. And our motives are right. We want to bring glory to God. And yet God's just the door and he just won't let us proceed. Maybe it's because we, figuratively speaking, are wanting to win cities for Christ when he wants to give us a continent. In other words, we're asking for something that's good. But he says, oh, I have something so much better if you'll surrender to me. When God says yes, when he gives us the green light and he tells us to go, that is wonderful. But sometimes I think his no's are even more glorious. Because his ways are so much higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts. And he's saying, I'm saying no. And if you will submit to me, and if you will stay surrendered, and if you'll listen to my voice, I will give you something and I will take you to a place that is better than you could have ever thought to ask on your own. And so when he says no, it's because it would have been better than if we had moved forward. He sees the whole picture. And if we will stay trusting him, we can know that he will never fail to give us what is best. Maybe some of you heard the saying that I heard growing up, God gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. But then we don't get stuck at the closed door and become complacent that we can just settle because there's nothing that God wants us to do because a closed door is not the end. He has a plan for each one of us. He has a good plan. And then when he opens the door like he did for Paul, when he tells us go, we respond with complete and with quick obedience. I read in a, sto a story, an amazing story, of somebody who answered God's call to go. The true story of a woman, she was in Atlanta, and she was in her car, and she prayed. She said, God, I'll do anything for you. I will do anything for you. You know, that could be a risky thing to tell God. And, but it's a good thing. But he, she said, just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. So she was driving, and she felt like God was prompting her to turn left. Okay, well, this is an adventure, so she turned left. And after a little while, she says she was supposed to turn right, and so she did and after a little while, she ended up at a convenience store, and she felt that she was supposed to go in there. So she got out of her car, and she walked in, and she prayed, okay, God, what now? And the only thing that she sensed God was telling her was, go over in front of the clerk and stand on your head. And she prayed, Lord, are you sure? And he didn't say anything. And she really wasn't sure she heard from God. But she had just made this bold declaration, I will do anything for you. And it wasn't um, biblical, and it wasn't immoral. And so she thought, well, I mean, just risk her embarrassment. So I'll, I'll do it. There were other customers in the store, and so she didn't really feel like she wanted to do this in front of them. So she was busy reading chip labels until they left. And then as soon as they walked out, she ran over in front of the clerk, 
And she said, hey, look what I can do. And there was a pole there. And so she quickly just did a handstand against the pole. And from her upside down position, she saw him just drop his head and shake it. And she thought, he thinks I'm crazy. So she, so she swung down and she stood up and walked towards him. And then she saw that he was actually weeping. She's like, what's the matter? And he told her, about half an hour ago, I was sitting here working and I prayed, God, if you're real, have somebody come in here and stand on their head. <laughs> and he gave his life to Christ and began attending church. Now I'm not advocating that we all go begin standing on our heads to reach people for Jesus, right? We don't just act crazy to be outlandish. However, when God tells us to stop, we stop. But when he says go, we have to go. It doesn't have to be where or what we had planned. It doesn't have to be what we thought it would be or look how we thought it would look because God will go to great lengths to reach those who are hungry for him. And he's looking for a people who will partner with him in obedience to see that people are reached with the news of Jesus. So are you willing to go and answer that question? to submit to the closed doors and to walk boldly through the open doors to build his kingdom. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and they're going to lead us in the song, I Will Go. May that be true of us As we sing, just respond to the Holy Spirit's prompting you.
the benediction. May we be quick to go where God wants us to go because he has a lost world he wants to save. Go in peace.